Hi, welcome to the next episode of Cosmos Safari, the podcast. We're going to be talking today with Gordon Telepin, who is the developer of the software known as the Solar Eclipse Timer app. And this can be found in the Android and the Apple stores for download. Um, and in this episode, we'll be talking with Gordon about his new book, which is over 500 pages all about the day of the eclipse. And this discussion went so great. We uh, had a wonderful discussion with Gordon. It's about an hour long. And in this discussion, we talk about things from the very early stages of how you get started learning about eclipses for the beginner, all the way up through some of the more advanced concepts around astrophotography with eclipses. We definitely did not do anything but scratch the surface on this topic, however. So there's going to be at some point in the near future a part two, where we're going to be focusing even more on the astrophotography of a total solar eclipse and how to do it. Gordon has experience with five eclipses in his lifetime, and his experiences have provided him the ability to write this book and create these apps that make eclipses accessible for more people. Many of you may have even used his Eclipse Timer app back in 2017. So without further ado, let's take a look at our discussion with Gordon Telepin. Well, welcome everybody to Cosmos Safari. We have Dave Farina here and Rob Webb and Dr. Gordon Telepin. Gordon is a board certified plastic surgeon in private practice in Decatur, Alabama. Uh, he's also an amateur astronomer who became passionate about total solar eclipses uh, after witnessing his first one in Zambia, Africa in 2001. Uh, he's been fortunate to observe and photograph four more solar eclipses. That's three more than me. Uh, and after the 2001 eclipse, he developed the concept of a digital eclipse talking timer uh, that would announce the countdowns to the contact times. And then once we got smartphones, uh, the talking timer concept was released uh, before the eclipse in 2017 as a mobile app called Solar Eclipse Timer, and that included geolocation and calculation of precise times. Uh, the app was really helpful for lots of people in 2017. And there's an updated version now of the mobile app for the 29 or there was one for 2019 and 2020, and there's one ready for 2024 as well. Additionally, he's also pulled together a book that is over 500 pages long and is titled Eclipse Day 2024. Um, uh, how to enjoy, observe, and photograph a total solar eclipse. And that book is available as a multimedia interactive book for Apple and Android tablets. And it is also available as a partially interactive PDF version, and a print version is soon to be released as well. So welcome, Gordon. How are you doing today? Man, I'm great. Uh, I really appreciate um, you inviting me to be on the show and be able to start to talk about the 2024 eclipse. I mean, it's it's getting close. I guess it's about 14 months away. There's a lot of work to do and a, and a lot of educating to do. Indeed, yeah. I just got a, a planetarium show today uh, that talked all about the two eclipses coming up and it's getting me very excited as well. Um, so we are, both Dave and I are amateur, or we are astronomy educators and amateur astronomers, and, and we're getting excited as well. We both traveled south. Um, I went to South Carolina. Dave, where did you go for 2017? I went to Land of the Lakes, Kentucky for my solar eclipse experience, my first solar eclipse experience. And mm -hmm. as Rob said, we both used your app. Um, I cannot tell you how important the having of that app was for me to feel comfortable because it was my first solar eclipse. I didn't, didn't know, you know, all there is to know with respect to when I could have my solar glasses on, solar glasses off, and to have that confidence that, you know, it was in fact safe to be looking at the sun at a particular point in time. And, you know, not just myself, but the people around me benefited from, you know, me having that app. And um, I was able to tell like, I'd probably say 25, 30 people in my local area, like, okay, now it's safe. You guys can take your glasses off. And that made all the difference for me to feel like it just went off without a hitch. So I really, really appreciate um, all the efforts that have gone into this over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad you guys used it and I'm glad it helped. Yeah. 
Yeah. In fact, if, um, if, uh, if I can share later, maybe not during the podcast, but, um, if you look at my YouTube channel, I have a video of our total solar eclipse experience. It was me and the whole family and your, who, who was the recording voice? Was that you or somebody else? No, that's me. I'm recording. That's you. Yeah. So your voice is in one of my YouTube videos. So <laughs> congratulations. You know, I, I gotta tell you, that's, I don't, I'll, I'll go to your video. That's one of, my most gratifying things is to find YouTube videos of families watching the eclipse and hearing my app talk in the, in the background. But the, the most important thing is seeing the families take advantage of the cues because that is the benefit of the talking timer. So things like, um, like before second contact, it'll say, look for shadow bands. And you'll see mm -hmm. you know, a guy will be holding a video camera and then he'll look down at the white sheet because eclipses are so exciting, you'll forget to do those things. So that's that was the whole concept of the talking timer. The other one that I love is during totality, right after the timer counts down to max eclipse and, and the tone plays, there's a reminder to observe the horizon. And it never fails that there's some dad with a video camera who will spin around and say, hey, everybody, look at the horizon. Because again, it, it's something you're probably gonna forget because of the excitement of totality. So again, you guys have experienced the benefits of having this talking guide you know, through the eclipse. And, and that was the whole concept from the first one that I developed from 2002. So um, before we go too deep into the weeds here, um, you've made a book. The book's very, very thorough. Um, as Rob said, over 500 pages. And the whole point of that, if I understand correctly, is it's all about that one day and how did it get the most out of it? Is that accurate? Yeah, that's exactly right, Dave. So here's the thing. When I started preparing for eclipses in 2001, there wasn't a lot of eclipse information on the internet, and you basically had to go buy the books. And then I have all the eclipse books. I mean, I've purchased all of them through time, and I love all the authors. I have the deepest respect for them. But what I realized was if you're preparing for an eclipse, the eclipse books that are out there now or before my book are written in chapters that are not the way the day aligns. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to prepare for eclipse, like you have to read stuff like in the photography chapter, and then you have to read things like in the astronomy chapter about the eclipse. And then you might read things and like how to set up a video and that'll be in a different chapter. So, as the reader and as the user, you have to do all the work. You have to go back and forth from all of these chapters and then coalesce the information. And then on top of that, nowadays, you're going out to the YouTube to get additional information. So when I right. started writing this book two years ago, my concept was to put all the information you need about a particular point in the eclipse at that point of the eclipse. So when in my book, when you're reading the chapter on first contact, you have the astronomy in there, you have the science, you have how to photograph it, you have how to video it. It's all in the element for that part of the eclipse. You don't have to jump around. And, and that was my point. And I think it's being well accepted. I'm not sure, it's hard to get feedback on digital version books, you know, like right. people appreciate it or not. But I don't know, it was well, my I, idea after preparing for eclipses for 21 years, that's the way I wanted to do it. And so that's what I did. I'm just gonna put a plug in here. You know, if anybody is in fact uh, in the process of reading through this book or have read this book and you would like to give Gordon some feedback, please do so in the comments of this video or um, send me an email at dave at cosmosafari.com and I will make sure that Gordon gets that uh, information or you know can head over to his website as well um, for solareclipsetimer.com. I'll put it in the ticker down below. Yeah, So that email. feedback would be great. Yeah, I have an email address that I monitor. And you know, uh, one of the most important things really if people like the book or even if they have some comments where they think there can be some improvement is go to the Apple store and go to the Google store 
and, and write a review that's really helpful um, to help other people even find the book. And I know it takes a lot of time and, and people don't want to do it, but uh, reviews are helpful in the Google and Apple uh, bookstores. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, your background as uh, a, a surgeon um, has you every single day probably explaining challenging, difficult to understand things to people, but you're going to have to put that in, in your own words. So um, I believe we've discussed previously that this has kind of been helpful in your ability to kind of take this very technical eclipse concepts and bring them down to the general public. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I I'm glad you brought that up, Dave. So my day is it deals with teaching the public and my patients about complex operations. And so I you're teachers and I'm a teacher of surgery every day. And um and it's just part of my life. So that's I think why I was so drawn to eclipses and teaching about eclipses, even right from 2001 when I went to, to my first one. I like to try to make the complex simple to the lay public. And I like technical things that are not a lot of high tech math. You understand? And, and eclipses yeah. are beautiful in that way because they're challenging. There's a lot to learn about it if you want to learn how to enjoy the whole day completely. And I just wanted to feed the information to people in a way that's easy to digest. And, you know, I think in the intro of my book, I explain it that my book is like, you, you've heard the metaphor of peeling away the layers of an onion. You know, my book can be as technical as you want it to be. I tell people, if you just look at the pictures, because I mean, I have tons of illustrations. If you just looked at the pictures and read the captions for the pictures, you would understand the concepts for the day. You don't even have to read the text. And then when you read the text, you can read the more superficial stuff and start and stop because most of the chapters start easy and then get more technical as you get to the end. Or if you're an eclipse enthusiast, enthusiast and you really want to get into the photography, I mean, you can go all the way. I mean, there's very detailed information about how, how to have a successful day photographing the eclipse. So there's something for everybody. And, and I, like I said, if you just read, if you read the captions, look at the illustrations and the pictures, you'll know more than 95% of the people that show up to the path on eclipse day. You don't even have to read the text. So, so think about, um, in, in thinking about communicating this to, to the public, um, and we have some beginner, uh, astronomers in our audience as well what would be how do you convince somebody in the general public to go see this you know i mean i think all of us sort of figure out oh eclipse definitely worth seeing but some people just you know they don't really care about the sky how, what what's your elevator pitch for somebody like yeah you gotta go see this like what what's your elevator pitch for the eclipse you know rob that that's such a great great question i i don't know if you can convince somebody to do it other than to say you need to do it and believe me it will be worth it no matter what you have to do to get to the path um there's there's no good way to explain it until you've really witnessed it i mean you guys have seen it you know what i mean now for astronomers it's easier i mean the thing that i like about eclipses with astronomy and you know we're always used to looking at small things or dim things, like if you're taking pictures of galaxies or nebula, or you're looking at Jupiter through a telescope or Saturn through a telescope, it's, it's really small. But you know, an eclipse is three or four times as big as the full moon in the sky when you take the corona into consideration. So it's a huge bright object that as amateur astronomers, we don't get the chance to um, to experience. That's the other thing that's beautiful about it. But then you take the astronomy of calculating the path. You take the fact that an eclipse creates all these thermodynamic uh, events on the Earth because the moon is basically being a big dimmer switch and shutting off all the electromagnetic energy 
to the earth in the path at a very slow rate. It's just fascinating. Everything about it is fascinating. Now, I have a, it's like a top of mind question here because I saw pre prior to the actual eclipse that it was cloudy. And then right, right before the eclipse was about to happen, fortunately it got clear and then it got cloudy almost immediately after. And that I had that same conversation with a bunch of other people that they experienced that same thing. You've been through four eclipses now. Is that, is that something you've seen uh, for yourself? So I've been to five and the five. time okay. that I saw it, the, the, the most amazing time was in 2017 because I was in Tennessee and it was a perfect, a perfect example of um, the energy delivered to the sun, creating rising thermals that then condensed to be light convective clouds. And as the energy goes away, um, the thermals decrease and then the convective clouds no longer have the moisture they need to survive and, and they go away. So seeing the, um, the formation and the dissipation of convective clouds during the time between first contact and second contact is amazing. I have a whole chapter on that in my book and I have a YouTube video that explains it in detail. Wow. Okay. I, I'm glad that that's a thing because I I've made my point with that with many people, and I I just kind of was is it was an observation, but not necessarily backed up with any science. So I'm excited to read that chapter. Yeah. Myself. No, I completely did not believe Dave when he told me that. I was like, no, that is not. That was just coincidence, right? Right. But I I guess there's some science I'm glad behind it's not it. the other way around because that would be a that would be horrible, right? You, right? You're like clear, 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 and then just clouds as soon as it starts to become totality. So fortunately, it's the other way around. It's the other way around for convective clouds, Dave. Now there is another cloud phenomenon that I talk about briefly in my book because it's only by report, being reported to me uh, from other eclipse chasers. I've never seen mm -hmm. it. There is this phenomenon where clouds can form right before totality because there's enough moisture in the higher atmospheres that as mm. the penumbra cools the higher atmospheres it can condense and create clouds so that's a whole different phenomenon that can happen in i i think it's more in the tropical environments where there's this lot a lot of moisture in the upper atmosphere that under normal circumstances won't condense but the penumbra can um cools it enough to, to condense. That's different than the summertime convective cloud uh, phenomenon that we were talking about with convective clouds that what the term is that they're linked to the ground, meaning that they're linked to the moisture coming up to the ground from the ground mm -hmm. to feed them with the moisture. But it's wonderful to watch them dissipate. Now, people have to be careful though. These are the light fluffy clouds that you see in the summertime on a clear day that do not have like the dense gray bottoms. If cumulus clouds are rolling in that have dense gray bottoms, that's a little bit more risky. They're not going to have enough time to dissipate and they're there for another reason. So if they're starting to pop up, that's some kind of front coming through, you know, and they can roll in front of totality, you know, right at the wrong time. So uh, right. I have a lot of pictures of that in in my my book. One of one of the things I do in that cloud chapter is besides just talking about it, I have seven or eight pictures of the different kind of clouds and the ones that you don't have to worry about and the ones that you definitely have to worry about. Um, so now, do you try to stay do you try to stay mobile when you're observing an eclipse, or do you just try to do your best and cross your fingers? I mean. No, well, you, you, it's a combination of things. So first of all, you definitely follow the weather prediction models. You guys are all familiar with Jay Anderson, the retired meteorologist out of Canada who works with Fred Espinick all the time. And he has um, a website called Eclipsophile. You guys have been to that, I'm sure. Have you? No, no. I haven't. No, you haven't. Well, I'll send you the slides, Dave, and you can put, we'll them, put them in the, the show links. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, Jay Anderson from Canada, he does um, historical analysis 
of the fractional cloud coverage all along the path. So you mm. use his information first and you see, okay, in this path, based on historical data, what's my best chance of having clear skies? And then you always take into consideration the season and what the prevailing kind of high pressure, low pressure systems are for any point along the path. And then you try to stay mobile. So for like 2024 in April, Jay right. Anderson, his fractional cloud cover uh, percentage is really low in Mexico. It's like less than 30 percent. And yeah, it's really I'm looking low. at it right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's really low when you get to the border of Texas. It's in the 40 percent range in southwestern Texas. But the further you go to the northwest, the more risky it gets. Right. But remember, this is April. There can be a bad weather front anywhere along the path in April. And the other problem that we have in the United States, you know that our weather fronts generally will take a track across the country that goes west to east with a little bit of a northern kind of pant. So weather fronts could follow this path. I mean, they could track right. right across the path. So uh, what that you would be the do, worst. Yeah. What you need to do is take the early data from Jay and then watch the weather fronts about 72 hours before, mm -hmm. and then decide whether or not you think you're gonna to go to your primary observing position or, or go somewhere else. Look, 2024 mm -hmm. is important. You don't wanna miss it because you dedicated yourself to one observing position. I mean, having a four minute eclipse uh, for an eclipse that you don't have to travel to internationally is a big deal. I mean, people shouldn't miss it. Right. Great. And yeah. the, the number of people I want to say is in like the tens of millions that are going to yeah. be just living on the path. That's not exactly to mention right. people who are driving into go view it, but tens of millions. I think it's, I want to say it's like 60 million. It is or something it's, that, it, along the path. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. It's more than 2017 for sure. Like, so my primary observing position right now, I'm working on a spot that I have uh, reserved is uh, north west of austin texas but i also have a secondary site in arkansas and a third site in indiana so what mm. you want to do in eclipse chasing because of the speed that fronts move generally 30 to 40 miles an hour you want to have observing path observing positions about 500 miles apart so that you can either be in front of a um, in front of an approaching weather front by 10 hours, or you can drive through a weather front and be on the other side. Right. So people who are serious about not missing this eclipse want to have at least two observing points along the path about 500 miles apart. And then you watch the weather about 72 hours before the eclipse and you go to one of those. Hmm. Wow. That's that's really good to kind of consider because I know that my one shot at it was at one location and I thought, you know, maybe uh, if I could drive 50 miles. So I'm underestimating by 10 times uh, by doing that. So I really should be looking at uh, quite a big distance. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. That's right. And so you have um, you have Jay's um, uh uh, map up there right now. So the blue down in Mexico is the least risk. The green, as you get into northeastern Texas, is moderate risk. And that red up in, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine is terrible risk. Yeah, that's where yeah, I'm I, be. I've been trying to figure out like <laughs> where where do I want to go? And and Texas Shoot. seems like the the best place to go. Um, but that that's a flight, you know, like that, that's yeah. a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, Dave and I are up in Pennsylvania. It would be very convenient to go to Erie or Buffalo, but I mean, there's a 80% chance of it not showing up. So it's so tough. It's a huge, yeah. it's huge. Um, you got to follow the weather fronts and and just decide what to do. I mean, you know, um, it would be great to go to Mexico for this eclipse, but look, I've gone to, I guess, three 
international eclipses or four international eclipses now and to do this one domestically and be able to drive to my site i didn't want to turn this into an international eclipse for another you know eight seconds of totality time i'd right. rather just get to texas now are you as excited for the october annular eclipse as you are for the uh 2024 total eclipse so that's a good question and the answer is yes and no i i am excited because i've never been to an annular i've never taken the time to go internationally to an annular or even drive out west to an annular there was an annular in the past i don't remember the year i think it was 2012 that i was thinking of going to but i didn't look it's it's kind of all about totality um you know that's what take that opportunity to explain the difference because i know that some of our audience as rob said is is just learning astronomy and we want to make sure that we don't lose them here with the annularity and all of the discussion between the two eclipse types yeah sure so um let's talk about a total eclipse first because that's easier right. when a, a total eclipse happens when the angular diameter of the moon in the sky is going to be bigger than the angular diameter of the sun in the sky. So it's going to completely obscure the sun. And because that happens, the shadow of the moon, which is a big cone shaped shadow that comes off the moon, the tip of that cone will strike the earth and create a path of totality as it moves across the earth, you know, at a very high rate of speed, you know, over 1400 miles an hour. In an annular eclipse, the angular diameter of the moon is just slightly smaller than the sun in the sky. So the moon cannot obscure the sun completely. There will always be a ring of photosphere around the moon. Now the moon is still creating a shadow, but the shadow stops short of the earth. It stops out in space the umbra never touches the surface of the earth from a space perspective, but from an observer's perspective on the earth, you never get to stand in the umbra. And when you look up, it's never safe to not have solar eclipse glasses on or have your gear protected because there's a tremendous amount of photosphere still um, peeking around the outer um, the outer surface of the moon. It's kind of like a bullseye. I like to call it a bullseye partial eclipse because it's a partial eclipse, except the moon's going to end up being in the middle of the sun instead of being to one side of the sun. I'm going to repeat that again, just because we want to make sure people are clear with this. With the annular eclipse, there is not any point at which you can take the solar glasses off. That's okay? correct. That is that is a very important different differentiation between these two eclipse types. Never right. ever take your solar glasses off for an annular eclipse. Right. And always protect your camera gear. So I'm going to go to this annular though. I'll probably go out to, I guess, New Mexico. And one of the the things about an annular eclipse in 2023 that people should understand is if you photograph 2020 and 17 and you just kind of did okay and you want to get better equipment and maybe this time you want to guide you know with a guide or a motorized mount you just want to up your game or if 2024 is your first eclipse and you're a photographer and you want to photograph it the annular is a great practice eclipse for everything that you have to do except removing your solar filter at C2. Everything else about it, how you set up, how you guide, how you monitor the contact times, everything else is a great practice session for 24, except removing your solar filters. Hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely in that category. And I believe Rob is pointing to himself saying it was it's his interests as well. Um, so for the, you're saying just anybody who's interested in taking a, a picture of this, um, what, what kind of, if you, you know, if you're interested, but you're not sure what you should be getting, like, what's the very base equipment that you would need to do something justice? You know, I mean, cell phone cameras are, are, are getting good. Is yeah. there, is there a pathway there? 
that that can get a, a decent result? Um, or do yeah, you need something you know, just a little bit higher end? I think you have to go higher end. I mean, if you, you can't, you can't, use a cell phone handheld and take a picture of the corona there'll be too much motion so if you can if you have a cell phone where you can mount it because they do buy cell phone mounts and you can put it on a tripod and you can have a remote camera release for your cell phone they do have bluetooth remote camera releases i've i've used them and then if you can download some kind of app to your cell phone that allows you to adjust shutter speed, that it's not always just totally on automatic, you can actually probably do it with a cell phone. I've not tried to do that or teach about that. That's not okay. really my interest. Yeah. My interest when I give talks about eclipses, even before 2017, is that most amateur photographers, if they have a DSLR camera at home, they probably have a good enough setup to take killer pictures, really. I mean, yep. all, you just need a solar filter. You have to get to a focal length of about 600 millimeters uh, and you'll be fine. And you need a remote camera release. If your camera can go into manual mode, you can set the color balance to daytime, which you know they all can do. Uh, you can put it on a tripod and have a remote camera release, either wired or unwired remote camera release, you can you can just get killer eclipse shots. We've covered your book. Um, I think it sounds like an amazing product for people to get to to help uh, actually plan and figure out what they're doing. Um, what about the timer app? Um, can you explain a little more about what it does and maybe what it does differently uh, now that it's seven years later? Because I know, um, you know, I used it. I loved it. It was great. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how it works and some updates you've made? Yeah, sure. So let me just talk a little bit about the origin of it. When in 2001, when I went to my first eclipse, you know, I was an amateur photographer and I wanted to do eclipse photography. And I followed all of the stuff that Fred Espinick had published about how to do it. And I practiced a lot. I, I went through my routine in my living room, like how I was going to change my shutter speeds and when I was going to take my exposures. You know, back then we were shooting with 200 speed slide film. So you had to know exactly what you were going to do because you didn't have an unlimited amount of pictures you could take. Well, anyway, I got to Africa in 2001. And despite all of my practice, when second contact was approaching i was so distracted that i was late with my photography i missed the diamond ring and bailey's beads going into second contact even though i thought i knew what i wanted to do and then you're standing there in totality it's amazing uh 2001 was beautiful because jupiter was in the sky really bright right next to the eclipse and you're watching it and then i missed third contact i was late coming into third contact. So as soon as I got back to the States, I realized you cannot time an eclipse with your watch. You're, you're just going to miss things. And it's dark. You know, back then you didn't have cameras with LED backlit screens. So you couldn't see your settings. So I realized that eclipse photographers needed audio cues. They needed some way to know what was happening and when it was happening and a timing countdown to the to the contact times and mid eclipse so i made the first talking timer for 2002 which was completely manual it ran on on windows pocket pc you had to put in your contact times and you had to manually know what they were going to be for your location put them in and then the timer would talk you through the, through the eclipse and it worked great we used it in 2002 on our expedition but the error w was involved in that because you had to get your contact times from extrapolating it from the printed um circumstances for the path of the eclipse and they were like 20 or 30 seconds apart where they gave you data so in 2002 we were about five seconds off with our extrapolation but then fast forward to 
um, cell phones that are basically computers with geolocation, we could put automatic geolocation into the app. So the app finds where you are and the formula for calculating the contact times is in the app. So for your specific location, you can geolocate calculate the contact times to within a tenth of a second and then load them into the timers and then at that point the timing function and all the announcements are automatic and linked to the contact times that get calculated by the timer so uh, mobile devices being so uh, powerful with their computing power uh, was a game changer really uh, to, to make it easy for people to geolocate and be talked through the eclipse. And, and one of the things that I even started in 2002, but it, it's more in the new app, is, you know, reminders during um, the first partial phases for all of the partial phase phenomena. Like there's three reminders to ask yourself if you're feeling a decrease in the temperature changes there's a reminder to do pinhole projection of the crescent phases that just is going to pop up um, there's a reminder to um, look for shadow bands of course there's a reminder to observe for changes in animal behavior as you're getting closer to second contact um, there's a reminder to look for the the phenomena of um, your shadows being sharp or fuzzy, depending on whether or not you are in alignment with the crescent behind you. And then of course, for the photographers, the exact countdown times to second contact and third contact, so you can anticipate taking your images. And then there's a, a, a mark for mid eclipse. So you know when it's about half over. And we've already talked about then observing for the horizon. And then after third contact, when everybody is celebrating that they've just had a successful eclipse, there's a reminder to keep the photographers focused by reminding them to put back their solar filters onto their equipment, look for shadow bands, and look for the umbra exiting your position so these are all things that um the reminders the vocal reminders the audible reminders uh help you uh do on eclipse day so you get the most out of out of the event but again being all automated now is wonderful and the other thing is my app the the formula for calculating the contact times is within the app you do not need cell service and you do not need an internet connection. It's all self-contained. So if the phone can um, geolocate, even if it has to use the, the GPS satellites, it can still calculate your contact times. It does not require the internet. It does not require cell service. And that's, that's a big deal because there's gonna be places where uh, either cell service will go down because it's gonna be overwhelmed. That happened in 2017 to some other apps that required internet service. And in 2017, there were broad swaths of the path out west where there wasn't even cell service. So having it being completely independent is important. So yeah, the app is ready for 2024. You just download the data set I, I charge $1.99 for the data set. I, I think that's inexpensive. And then you get to your observing site, geolocate. It calculates the contact times. You load them into the main timers, and that's armed. Once you do that, the app is armed, and it's going to time the day. Yeah, I will say that that was extremely helpful uh, during the eclipse, just to have those audible things, uh, because it, it's it's hard enough just to you know, you're running a camera, or if you're me, you're running three cameras. Um, you're running audio. I was recording myself and my family as we were doing this. There was a lot going on, and to have those audible reminders was was key. Let me ask you this though: um, when I when I went, I flew, so I could have. Uh, I had a couple cameras, like a GoPro. I had uh, two DSLRs, and I was taking a bunch of pictures, um, and it, it was all great. I got wonderful stuff. But I do know that when I got there, 
I had binoculars with me for the purpose of seeing the corona during totality. I completely forgot about using them. <laughs> it just sort of went 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 completely out of my mind. Um, is there a way to do like your own reminders, kind of add some other ones in there? Or is it pretty much like you've got the data, you've got exact precision, here you go, do with it what you will? You know, that's that's a really good point. Um, I so look, I'm an independent app developer and a full-time plastic surgeon. So I have to be sure what I put out there, I can support. And developing apps is tricky. I mean, I'm not a programmer. I have to work with people who do it. The more stuff you put in there that's user definable, the more problems you're going to have. And I can't support effectively things like that that are user definable but you've given me idea i mean i could certainly i'm working with programmers right now because we have to update the delta t in the app because right now it's not doing the precise calculation because the delta t uh the offset between universal time and the time you use in the algebra changes and they a few months ago they changed it for 2024 so i have to up grade the app. But I could certainly add an announcement for used binoculars. Uh, I added the uh, announcements for Observe for Umbra Approach and Umbra Exit because of Rick Feinberg from AAS. He thought that would be a good idea. So for 2019, I added that. It's not too hard to add another announcement as long as I know where it's going to be and it's in the same place all the time. Um, on that same <laughs> request feed, uh, <laughs> I was thinking as you were going here, you know, from like an astrophotography standpoint, from like the camera settings standpoint, you had mentioned as your Zambia trip, that was one of the main things you were kind of missing, not only the timing, but to have to adjust settings on your camera on the fly. Right. It would be neat neat almost as a toggle i think because not everybody's doing the photography but to be able to toggle yes i am doing photography and i'd like yeah. to hear those announcements also would be really good because i i did fumble my way through what settings i would have and that you know it's something you can practice to some degree but um that would be really helpful i think for those advanced um folks and I'd pay, I'd pay more money for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you though, I, I, I gotta be honest with you, the more you put in there, uh, the more technical support um, calls it's right. going to be. It's, right. hard, Especially... it's hard to support that stuff. Y and every camera is different. Yeah, and you would be surprised even as basic as the app is for geolocating and getting it to work, that people who are not app savvy and who are not astronomers uh, don't really even get my, you know, graphical user interface. It, it's hard. It's hard for people who mm -hmm. don't understand eclipses to get through it. And look, there's parts of my app that that mm -hmm. are not that technical and people don't use right now. So you're talking about eclipse practicing. Uh, it would be hard to put in cues for what shutter speeds to use where. Right because you don't know what ISO people are starting at and you don't know what f-stop they're starting at. So these are things you have to determine for your own gear and practice. But let me tell you a story. In 2001 and 2002, I used to practice my photography routine in my living room by playing through my TV, a video that Fred Espinick had of a short eclipse, mm. some, I think it was in Bolivia, and I would play it really loud as a distraction so I could watch the video, hear the audio, and then practice doing my camera settings. And that's how I practiced for 2001 and 2002. Well, my app, the new one, I, no, I had it in 2017 too, but the new one has a new video in it. But I have a pre-recorded Eclipse video in, in my app. And you go to it and you can play that video and it synchronizes to the timer. So there's about, mm. it's about a four and a half minute video with a pre-planned two minute eclipse where you can practice all your settings ahead of time. You can go through dry runs as many times as you want to. 
Now, the, mm. the beauty of it is in 2002, when I wanted to practice, my timer was manual. So if I went through you know, a, a photography practice sequence, I would have to shut down the timer, put in times in advance, like five minutes or 10 minutes ahead of the time I was physically at and start the whole thing again. But the new app in the phone, it automatically resyncs to your local time and it, in, it, it, it automatically resyncs to playing the timing functions. So you can practice over and over again in your living room to practice changing your shutter speeds, practice taking off your solar filter, practice putting your solar filter back on, all dry runs, you know. Another part of my app that I think very few people use, which I thought was a huge development, and I've gotten great feedback uh, feedback from it from the people who who used it was the thing that I call my partial phase image sequence calculator. And what that does for the average eclipse photographer, I mean, the average photographer who does not want to set up an intervalometer and take all of those partial phase pictures up to totality and then take the totality picture and set up the intervalometer again for third contact to fourth contact, my app recalculates 10 clock times between C1 and C2, and then 10 clock times between C3 and C4, that if you take pictures at those calculated times, you will have a perfect sequence of 10 partial phases before and 10 partial phases after. It's so simple, and it's specific for your observing a position, because the calculation is done on the fly based on the four contact times. And then Are there I'm, audio, audio huh? cues for that? No, there's not audio cues. Okay. So yeah. then on my website, I have a PDF document that you can print out that has your contact times and then the 20 clock times. So you can print out that PDF form and write them down. So on Eclipse Day, you okay. just them off, you know, as you're taking the times. It also has reminders for when you should refocus during the partial phases and, and other reminders on the PDF um, document that you can download, you know, for free. And then you can get a perfect sequence um, through the Eclipse. I used it in 2000 and well, I used it in 2017 for my like sequence of partial phases, but then I used it in 2019 for my single image sequence of having the entire eclipse set into the Andes Mountains. And I used the partial phase, you know, image sequence um, calculator times for that, and it worked out great. It's so much easier for the novice eclipse photographer than trying to learn how to set up intervalometers during an eclipse, shut it off for the time you're going to take your totality pictures, and then restart it again. It's just another thing you don't have to do. Another, you know, technical gear you don't have to buy and learn. Right, right. Well, I, I actually am excited for that. I didn't really realize that was in the app. And I'm, uh, sounds like exactly what I want is just that sequence the image for the totality and the sequence. Right. And I'm actually thinking, you know, as we're t discussing this, I'm like, well, what am I going to do? You know, I, I haven't really thought through this fully. Um, so for me now, I'm thinking about this. I do want to have uh, like a, a high focal length, 600 millimeter or so shot. Um, but I also do believe I want something that's more of like a, a nightscape or like a landscape type of a version of it. Right. Um, depending on where I am, hopefully the, the foreground is beautiful. Um, but, uh, you know, regardless, I think it, it's, it's interesting to have that perspective, those two different perspectives. So if you have multiple cameras, how could I set that up? And now I'm running two cameras to have that help, you know, in, in, in that process to not have to think in on the fly to have those ideas already ready to go might be extremely helpful. So no, I agree enough. with you. There's nothing there. there the, the shots of a total sequence of the eclipse in the sky with something in the foreground is beautiful. And I knew when I went to South America in 2019 that my observing position was actually going to have fourth contact set below the Andes Mountains. I knew I wouldn't see it. 
uh, and the total eclipse was 11 degrees above the horizon. It was, it was just wonderful. Now, the problem with being like in the Southwest for the 2024 eclipse, it's a very high in the sky eclipse. It's 61 degrees in the sky. So it's hard to frame a foreground landscape Mm -hmm. um, with an eclipse that's that high, because you have to use such a wide focal length that the eclipse yeah, becomes something. very small. Now you could, yeah. you know, you cheat and put like a tree in front of it. So you have something in the foreground that's bigger and have the eclipse right. go over the tree. Those are all shots you have to kind of set up and, and pre-plan. And, you know, my, um, there's a chapter in my book on in in the appendix section for wide angle eclipse photography and i go through all of the details of how to do that how to set up your tripod how to fix your tripod uh what camera head you should buy um how to calculate um the field of view you need and the padding you need on both sides of your sensor so you don't run out of room because you have to start first contact at the proper position on your sensor so you know it's going to fit until you get to fourth contact all right i'm going to just ask now this has got to have to have a part two are you interested in coming on and we can talk astrophotography for solar eclipses as absolutely the theme. yeah that would yeah. be an amazing be discussion and i think that it would be well received from the on um, you know the the more serious of, of our observers um mm -hmm. that that would be a great thing to focus on i'd love to do that i mean i could foresee doing a show just on the partial phase phenomena which is one of my interests i've done more writing and more research and more YouTube videos on the details of the partial phase phenomena um, than anybody else. And we certainly uh, could do a, a talk on eclipse photography. You know, one of the things that I think I've generated help for the public, and I know people used it in 17, one of the hardest things for eclipse, novice eclipse photographers to do is to figure out their exposure settings because there's not a way to practice. But I realized through my eclipses that I, I know a relationship between if you're taking a full solar disk image with a solar filter, your camera settings for a full solar disk image, if you properly expose it, that means you have a, a nicely balanced center photosphere and you have limb darkening at the limb of the sun because the sun does darken at the limb. I know for your camera settings for that exposure that those same camera settings will expose mid corona or inner corona when your solar filter is off. That is such powerful information because you can practice with your gear right now on taking full solar disk images through a glass solar filter. It has to be with a glass solar filter because of the percentage of transmission of the light that glass does. I can tell you right now what your inner corona exposure is gonna be. I can tell you that ahead of time. And so then I know from that, I know what exposure you need to use for Bailey's beads and the diamond ring. You have to be about two stops faster. And then, then you just bracket for your totality images starting at Chromosphere and you know all your exposures ahead of time for any camera gear. That's what's beautiful about that system that I teach. If you're using a glass solar filter, you have to use a glass solar filter. No matter what your ISO is, I don't care. No matter what your f-stop is, I don't care. When you choose your shutter speed for a properly exposed fuller solar disk image i can tell you what your exposures have to be for belly speeds the diamond ring and the corona all ahead of is that outlined in the book as well though? it is absolutely in, in, in excruciating detail great yeah that's fantastic are we let, let's finish up with just a few uh questions kind of thinking ahead um so with the eclipses coming up, um, I guess one of the things is 
what are your future plans for writing publishing like like what's next uh in your mind what are you sort of what are those ideas that are just germinating in your head um and then kind of along those same lines like what would what would be a dream thing to have happen coming up like is is there something that you really is there an ideal picture that you really want to take or uh like what what are your goals uh in for the next decade i guess you could say so that's a those are great questions so you know people would think i'm crazy with how interested i am in the partial phase phenomenon you know so nobody's ever gone through the crazy little experiment i did with the the three bars you know separated and trying to line one of the bars up with the crescent phase and watching the sharp and fuzzy shadows change. Uh, I wanna do that again in 2023 because I wanna see how that, that experiment behaves during an annular. And then I wanna do it again in 2024. And I'm gonna get my three bars and I'm actually gonna guide it. I'm gonna follow the eclipse so I can have a nice smooth time-lapse um, movie of how the sharp and fuzzy shadows change during an eclipse. That's one of the most uh, confusing things for people. You'll find after any eclipse that people post pictures on the internet or Instagram of their arm out and they say stuff like my arm looked fuzzy or my arm looked sharp or my shadows changed, but they never take it to the next level. They don't understand why that's happening. And, and I like to discuss that. So I'm going to take that little crazy experiment to one other level. The other thing that I'm really fascinated is uh, in shadow bands. So I have some other ideas for documenting shadow bands, you know, at the next eclipse, you know, I want to do that. Um, when I did my sequence picture of the eclipse um, setting into the Andes Mountains in 2019, that was killer. I, I don't know if I can ever do anything that nice, but I already am signed up for the eclipse that's going to be in 2027 in Egypt. And my plan for that eclipse is to try to have the eclipse arch over a palm tree. That eclipse is at 80 degrees in the sky. So you'd have to be like basically almost under the palm tree, you know, facing up to get that arch over the palm tree. So I would like to do that. And then one other thing, you know, when people have gone to enough, enough eclipses that they've enjoyed totality enough, some of the real dedicated eclipse chasers, people that have been to more than me, I mean, I've been to a lot, but there's people who have been to many, many more and are better at it than I am. So sometimes you want to pick an eclipse that you can go to either the northern or the southern edge of the path. You don't try to get into the middle and maximize your totality time. You want to get to the edges of the path and maximize your time of Bailey's beads. That's something that I want to do in 2026 with the eclipse that sets in Spain. It actually starts in the North Pole and crosses Iceland and ends in Spain. And that would be a great eclipse to get on the edge of the path and try to document a long time of Bailey's beads because of the way the moon is offset on the sun. It's not centered. So you get a long time of the limb of the moon crossing the limb of the sun. So, you know, those are kind of my plans to make 2024 a great science eclipse for the partial phase phenomena and continue to teach people about that do good photography, you know, which I always want to do. Uh, and then the future eclipses, you know, I have some other ideas. That's fantastic. I, <laughs> that, that, that certainly takes a lot of dedication to pick a spot where you're not maximizing your eclipse time. Like that's. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't do that early on. I mean, you have to get a couple of totalities under your belt to want to do that. And I mean, I think if I'm successful in 2024, and I get a four minute plus totality. I think the next one I, I would do as a grazer like that. I think that would be fun. And again, you know, what you guys have brought up is so interesting is there is so much 
to do at an eclipse that you can't do everything at your first one. So you should pick the things that you would enjoy the most. And again, I try to coalesce that information for people so it's easy to find. I mean, there are things that you we have talked about tonight that you weren't perfectly aware about. I mean, it may have been in the back of your mind, but it's not something that's front and center until you kind of see it in black and white. Now you can read it in, in my book or you can watch it on my YouTube videos. That doesn't mean you're gonna do it at your first eclipse and that's fine. I hope that you're gonna get addicted to eclipses and will want to travel internationally to one. And at the subsequent eclipses, you can do some of the other stuff. Part of me wants to get like the best image ever. And part of me wants to do nothing. Exactly. and just watch it right you know and i really want i struggle with that you know because it, it is a completely different experience um and i i tell people you know one of the first questions rob asked you is you know how would you convince somebody who's never done this before to do it and for me um you know it, it, it is probably one of the only experiences i've ever had that i felt connected with the universe in a weird way that I've never really felt before. Um, you know, it, it sent chills down my spine, literally. Uh, I got so excited. I, could, I couldn't even contain my excitement. I was just yelling. You know, it was, it was amazing to me. And it's two minutes of my life that took me eight hours to get there, you know, and I would do it all over again. You know, it's, it's, it's something that that, right there tells me that it was worth it, that I know I will do it with a drop of a hat, even if it's an eight hour drive for two minutes, you know, four minutes. I agree with you. And, you know, um, the, the 2024 eclipse, if you can get to the Southwest is over four minutes long. So you have plenty of time to do photography at the beginning and then use the max eclipse marker at two minutes and 10 seconds or whenever that's gonna be to stop the photography and just enjoy the eclipse. You know what I mean? You have plenty, you have plenty of time. Um, and that's what I get those binoculars out at that point and get your binoculars out. <laughs> and, um, and I always, I, I always try to practice even with my app, which has a two minute eclipse in it. You try to get your photography done in that minute. By the time my practice session in the app is saying max eclipse, you need to start to be done with bracketing your totality images. So the max eclipse marker is a marker for being done with photography or at least finishing up your final chores. Right, and then you can experience it both ways. Good good advice, appreciate that. So um, one, one kind of closing question is, you know, I know you said now you have future plans for your eclipses. Do you uh, have future plans for writing again? You just wrote a 500 page book. I know that that, comes with its challenges is it is it worth it uh, enough that you think you're going to be doing more of this or or is it a one time deal you know i'll probably if i get good science in in 24 i might add some you know things that i've changed you know the wonder the wonderful thing about digital books is you can continue to edit them and i have done little edits and uploaded you know new versions and for the print version of course if i put it out there i want it to be as perfect as possible and i just had i paid a proofreader to read it again and clean up some things before I print it. Um, you look, every everybody who writes a book always finds things that they want to add. And yeah, I'll probably add things, but I think that this book is pretty comprehensive. For what I wanted to try to achieve, and that's help the novice have a great day, most of what you need is in there you know, right now, it, it really is. It certainly can always be cleaned up a little bit and, and little things can be added, but um, it's pretty comprehensive. You know, another great chapter in the book, in the appendix, is all the mistakes I've made. I have a chapter that documents all of the stupid things I've done at eclipses, and I've made a ton of them, believe me. Um, and, and I talk about them uh, outright and I show examples of the bad pictures and what I did wrong so that people don't make the same mistake. Um, there's a thing called eclipse gremlins. When you're at eclipse, um, equipment starts to break down and you have to stay focused and you have to stay on task. 
and you don't want to make mistakes. So I have a whole chapter on the mistakes I've made. So I think that's an important chapter. I've never seen anybody write that chapter. And I'm sure after 2024, I will have made other mistakes that I can add to that chapter. Are you ever planning on doing any sort of flight or eclipse cruise or have you done that already? So I did an eclipse cruise in 2006. I saw that eclipse on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and it was fun. I don't like eclipse cruises, cruises because it decreases the amount of focal length you can use. Because even in calm mm. conditions, the ship is bobbing, you know, like crazy. It really is. So you have to change your strategy for the photography. Um, the decks get very crowded. So there's a lot of people. You're all crammed in there. Um, I don't really have a desire to do another eclipse cruise. Um, and I don't really want to shoot an eclipse through an, a plane window. I mean, I've thought about that. There are some beautiful pictures of it uh, out, out there. I mean, maybe that's something I'd do in the future, but it's expensive and it's you don't get the experience of totality. It's really more about the photography. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm into Fair educating. I'm, I mean, I'm actually glad. I'm glad I asked you though, because it's like, it makes a lot of sense now that you say it about the cruise, sh you know, the ship rocking back and forth. And, you know, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's like, oh man, you know what? That does make a lot of sense. Hey, um, we were in calm conditions in the Mediterranean and my video cameras, the sun was bobbing up and down. Another really weird thing that happened on that cruise is I, you know, we, the, the good thing about cruises is there's a lot of eclipse talks as you're on the cruise they'll have an eclipse expert there and you'll get together in a big you know auditorium or conference room and and they'll talk about the eclipse one thing that they didn't tell us they were going to do and i didn't realize this till after we're cruising along the mediterranean sea and everybody's pointed up at the sun getting ready for first contact well about it must have been five minutes before first contact. The captain turned the ship around 180 degrees because I guess he was cruising into the path when we were starting. Mm. But during the eclipse, he wanted to be cruising with the eclipse. Right. So he turned 180 degrees and nobody told us he was going to do that. So everybody on the deck had to flip their cameras to be pointing the other way. And, you know, the thing about that is I was in the middle of the deck, so it didn't affect me. But if you were at the side of the deck where there was an obstruction to your backside, when he flipped the boat, you would have been pointing in the wrong direction. The other thing that really made me mad, they thought it was a great idea to sound the boat fog horns at second contact max eclipse and third contact that was the most um, um, annoying thing that's ever happened to me at an eclipse <laughs> to have my video of the eclipse and the the a ships <laughs> yeah, sounding their foghorn for like seemed like 10 seconds it was brutal so yeah um i'm not going to do an eclipse on, <laughs> oh, on a cruise. talk about distracting too like uh, i'm right, getting all right. the pictures all the pictures and my moment of thing. zen that I'm trying to like not take pictures and it's bah. exactly it was, it was horrible it was horrible <laughs> good to oh, know man. good to know all right well, well I just want to take a moment just Rob do you have any other questions no no I just wanted to say thank you so much Gordon this has been uh such such an excellent interview it's really cool um so where can our audience find you online where they where can they find your stuff yeah, so my main website, www.solareclipstimer.com, has the links, you know, to the to the books, to all my YouTube uh, videos. You know, I have a lot of YouTube videos out there. And in terms of what I'm doing about patient education, you guys will appreciate this. I have one by one in the states along the path reached out to the state science teacher associations and i've actually gotten some good feedback i'm in contact with the guys from new york i'm in contact with the people from pennsylvania mm -hmm. and in september i'm giving uh, a talk to the the big conference of the science teachers that get together at the beginning of the year in ohio so i'm reaching out directly to science teachers for this eclipse to I don't know, just give as many talks as I can to help them get prepared. Because I realized from 2017, in 2017, I 
I tried to work with the Board of Education in Alabama to get people to drive like an hour north to get to the path because it was right in Tennessee. And I was spinning my wheels. You can't, I realized then you can't work from the board level down. You have to work from the troops up. So I'm reaching directly to the science teachers and reaching out directly to the state science associations, the teacher associations, to try to get the word out about how to prepare uh, for this eclipse. I'd be interested. I, I don't know what the status of this website is. Um, I know that it kind of got mothballed, but there's the NASA Space Math website. And yeah. it sounds like you guys would have so much to add to that for an eclipse like, you know, with your calculations that you've already had to use within your app and things like that could make some really great little math worksheets for the NASA math website that I use now with my, with some of my students who are um, my uh, higher end students to get them using math and in science um, more. And it sounds yeah. like there's a lot of interest here and, and maybe there'd be uh, some people out there that could use that. So I don't know. That's, I worked with NASA, explored. not on the math thing, but I worked with NASA as a, a solar eclipse. They called it a content expert in 2017. And I've been accepted to be a solar eclipse ambassador by the Association Astronomy Association of the Pacific, which is also coordinating with NASA. So I'm trying to work those more public outreach things also in addition to my specific outreach to science teacher association well i'm gonna just say one more time we definitely need to have you back for a part yes. two or three or ten um <laughs> as this gets closer we're gonna have a lot more interest i i hope that uh those of you who are watching uh remind you that this is going to be a big event you're not going to want to miss it. So tune back in. We're going to hopefully get Gordon back on here for uh, some other content coming uh, in the months ahead. And don't forget to go to our Patreon page if you're still listening and watching because these uh, podcasts we're, you know, we're doing, we have to host them. That costs some money for us. Uh, we have to have services like we're using right now to record this video. And so any help that you can give us by going to our Patreon, we would really appreciate that, you know, even if it's just a few bucks, $3 a month. And what that can do is can provide you the opportunity to ask questions for guests like Gordon when they come on. Um, we'll get out the word in advance. We'll let you know who's coming on um, and what that topic will be. And you'll have an opportunity to ask questions directly from the experts. So that's one of the benefits. There's also other fringe benefits that are on the website. So check it out. Um, once again, this is Dave Farina from Cosmos Safari. Uh, and hey, Rob Webb from Observing this Web. And Gordon. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, guys. I really do. It was fun to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Cosmos Safari podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider to add us uh, as a page. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Cosmos Safari podcast. As always, please consider helping to support our Cosmos Safari podcast via Patreon. Your donations will help us to make sure that this channel continues to be able to be on air. We do have expenses for hosting these podcasts and for the production of these videos using our software. We have great guests on. And by being a Patreon patron, it will provide you the ability to ask questions of these people. Um, what we do is about a week before we have the guest on, we'll post up on the Patreon, um, you know, who we're going to be speaking with and what the topics are going to be. And we'll give you as a Patreon patron the ability to ask questions of that person. So please consider that. Um, there's a lot of other fringe benefits as well. And keep looking up, everybody. Thanks a lot.